the site you're looking at um, is all using that official data from the Afghanistan, uh, you know, officially from the Afghanistan government, and was originally built as an intranet to help a uh, National Democratic Institute's team in Afghanistan and their team in Washington, D.C., look at the data and start talking to various people in the country about what's going on. So this isn't something public at the time. But this kind of gives you a sense of how, how we started working with that data. And what was also important is it's not, it's not just about the map, right? It's not just about the visualization. Being able to drill down, let me click on a specific point and go down within that province to that specific district here, looking at Jiro, and get more context here. Let me see uh, other sets of, uh, of data that we've, that we've prepped, like population data, literacy data. Um, and you know, when you, again, when you start bringing different data sets together, you can start identifying Different, different patterns here that otherwise aren't, aren't traditionally, uh, traditionally obvious. And putting that next to your, you know, your, your, your real-time data, so much of what you just saw, these sets of data, this requires a lot of prep work, right? And so starting early before the election is really clutch. Um, what's neat about this was then that same highlight of stations tab we used on the map, you're able to drill down and actually see it on an individual polling center basis. So polling center as in the building, right? And then you can click a polling center and see the actual result per ballot box. And here, we've got three ballot boxes, candidate names, and votes. And so this is Karzai, 600, 600, 600. Right? So being able to, ha you just can't do that when, when data is locked into a PDF. So being able to, to break that data out of a PDF and put it in a way that you can quickly drill down into it or map it is, uh, is, is incredibly powerful. Um, and, and as you start liberating more and more data, that starts having more and more value. Um, in the case of 2009, we came into the election process about eight days after um, the election happened. Right? It took a while to get those ballots back. Um, it's, it's, it's rough terrain. There was a security situation, but as we started, as National Democratic Institute started seeing some of the data look a little weird, we were brought in. In 2010, we were brought in about two months early to help starting to prep. Um, currently, elections, presidential elections for uh, tw uh, 2014 are scheduled for early April. Um, that's 14 months out, and we've already started working on prepping more data. For, for that election. So you really, being able, there's just so much of a lift to be able to do across so many different sets of data. So who uses this data, right? This isn't, this isn't, this isn't about going to directly to the end user. There's this notion, hey, let's open up data and let's have you know, a hacker get together and let's make this for citizens. Um, I encourage uh, some of the groups in this room to look at themselves much more as an intermediary, right? Like, think of yourself as a, as a platform. You're grabbing data, you're packaging it up for somebody else to help communicate it out farther. So in the case of 2014 prep in Afghanistan, what we're doing is, you know, our open data work is going to help domestic observers, international observers, the government, uh, civil society organizations, and the media. And it's going to be them that then leverage that data uh, more efficiently and bring that to uh, actually to the people. That's not our job in this area. So there's just there's so much heavy data infrastructure and opening work that needs to happen. Um, and you know the last thing I'd say is like when you do a big open data lift, there's not this notion that you know hey if if we build it you know people will come and start using it. Uh, it doesn't work that way. You have to build in some serious you know, capacity building going on. And what I mean by capacity building is not just doing a training, but then helping people actually launch some of these applications together. Um, so let's look at, uh, at, at just a couple other examples of how powerful some of these maps can be. Uh, we, we were brought in by Internews um, in 2011 back to Afghanistan. They, uh, they had the largest media freedom award for, uh, for USAID. Uh, and a neat, you know, so there, there, there they are trying to build radio station towers, set up entire radio stations, build capacity with, with actual journalists. A real problem about media freedom is that when the journalists are being attacked, it's kind of hard to actually benefit from a lot of that infrastructure they're laying out. So working with one of their in-country partners, they, they, they'd started keeping this record, this spreadsheet of journalists being attacked. And they're just like, you know, people aren't really getting how big of a deal this is. And it's like, well, it's, it's a spreadsheet. 
just taking that one simple spreadsheet, had a couple columns in it, um, they were able to make this one page basic website showing where there is violence against journalists here. And this spreadsheet is all hosted on uh, Google Docs. So you really just pull in a feed right to the site and dynamically map it. These are Google Graphs being dynamically graphed. So you can see over time trends, you can see what it means, what, you like, what, what does violence actually mean. Um, and you can download the direct report. So you're not just doing a visualization, right? There's no such thing as neutral data visualization. I mean, you're telling a story. In this case, why, is it, why are those red dots and not green dots? Red's bad, right? Like, we're, we're, you know, like, this is all opinionated. But being able to put the raw data source out there is pretty neat. You, if you can see in the very bottom corner, you see what the URL says, docs.google, right? I mean, it's really just a link over, over to that. Um, this could evil, easily work with Matt's system. This could eas easily work with a host of other, other systems. The whole point here is being able to have really loose data and then be able to play and look at this. Hey, let's just look at 2012 here. And here, as soon as I click on a year, I get to see the entire data sheet. Again, let's not hide data. Let's click on a specific point here, Cobble. And now I've just refined my search. The point is, there is no database behind this, right? This is just a light HTML website. That's, that's, that's conceptually radically different than we've been thinking about doing data visualization over the last four to five years. That means this is really fast, and you're using these, these, these decentralized systems. So a lot of the presenters here that you've seen so far today, you could use various parts of their system and plug it together. And it's this kind of loose architecture that gives you a lot more flexibility to build with here. So um, let's talk about taking really large sets of data. Here, uh, and, and, and slow sets of data, you're still telling a story. Um, here, uh, uh, National Public Radio, it's very similar to, uh, to BBC, National Public Radio in the U.S. took um, uh, census data from 2000 and census data from 2010 and wanted to visualize a change in population. So here you see these purple areas are where people are leaving, where there's been a population decrease. Green areas are where people are coming. And what's neat is, as you zoom in, you can start seeing the counties emerge, okay? Um, if you want to see suburbia, these are these green donuts starting to emerge. And as I zoom in, I just went from being able to see a demographic breakdown by state to seeing a demographic breakdown by county. And now as I start zooming in farther, I can go all the way down to the actual census track, right? The individual uh, government uh, parcel that they're using. And now see this down at a certain, certain road level, right? This was a database of 25 million rows. How digestible is that? Now, as I, as I mouse over all these pieces, they're all fully interactive. So, I mean, this is hotel Wi-Fi, and there are over 70,000 interactive polygons, and there's no database behind this, right? This is a flat HTML site. So again, being some of the new technology starting to emerge that's really light and fast is giving you a tremendous amount of, of new tools to, to be able to, to tell stories. And that's really how, how we look at, look at some of the maps. Um, so let, let me talk about uh, more complex stories and how to start layering stories together uh, before I transition specifically into some of the stories that you can be telling uh, here in Tunisia. Uh, now, uh, about, what was this, 18 months ago now? Um, when, uh, when the famine uh, started hitting the horn, uh, USAID had a lot of different dispersed data sets. And there's a lot of causes of, of famine coming together. So how do you stitch that story together? This is, pretty, this is pretty complicated. So working with the One Campaign and USAID, this kind of gives you a sense of, let me move this over here, kind of a sense of what's possible. So first, let's, let's actually show where the famine's happening, okay? Let's show what it was three months before. Well, let's actually go in and focus on the famine area here and, and see how, how, that, how, uh, how that's actually changed and what might happen in three months, right? So being able to start seeing this sense of time play into your storytelling. Okay, so wait, what, what actually causes famine? All right, well, it's, it, it's caused by drought, right? So using open data from NASA, we're able to look at something called NDVI data. It's a vegetation uh, differential index. So we can take a snapshot in April 2010 and a snapshot in April uh, 2011, right before the famine, 
and be able to literally watch the horn go brown. All right, what effect did this have? All right, now let's pull in another set of data. Uh, there's something called the Famine Early Warning System. Um, it's a program run by, uh, run by USAID to actually have really localized um, price, price collection information. And they opened up six years of different price data. And now we're able to overlay that price data on the map and see six years of points going back. You're getting a sense of how, how, how fast some of these, these data points work. And what's neat about this context is you can see the spike here happening in July in some areas is even greater than the food crisis in uh, 2007, 2008. So you really start bringing over uh, multiple layers of data. Um, but clearly, this is uh, famine's not caused by drought. This is, this is man-made. Uh, back to my presentation this morning of needing powerful design tools. Let's, let's really focus on just two specific sets of data. Let's look at where the famine is, here in red, and look at where there's limited humanitarian access, areas of conflict these hash areas, and just focus on those, right? Because that's where the actual problem is. You see there's now 100% overlap. Okay, what effects is this having? Let's look at internally displaced people. Let's be able to mouse over these specific points and actually get the number of IDPs. All right, what, what effect did this have for refugees? Let's look at the camps here. Let's uh, mouse over and see an age breakdown, and then the influx coming in, graphed. Again, these are all just basic Google charts being graphed here. We can go all the way down here to the individual to the individual uh, camps and see the age break down there. So being able to uh, let people, w like walk people through maps with context is incredibly powerful. And more than just a common operating picture, this, this a, g a general concept of being able to dive, dive into the data and get a sense of what's going on. Um, let me hit that again, sorry. Um, being able to dive in here, this is OpenStreetMap data, again, that Wikipedia of maps. So I see the roads in Mogadishu, and I can get taken on this trip across Mogadishu. And in these red areas, these, these, this is from UNISAT, the UN satellite company, the agency, where I can see where the camps are. And those black dots, those are individual tents extracted from uh, feature distract, extraction in the satellites. And so this isn't like HTML5 or anything fancy or like a, a video. This is just a map with some JavaScript in it and being able to be taken on a tour. So point being, don't just put up the map. Put up context next to the map and use certain tools to really step you through that, that, that context. Um, but again, like what does is, what is actual open data uh, look like? This is what open data uh, looks like. Right, do you, do you have a microphone? Now you have a microphone. Could, could you talk? All right, so this is, this is, uh, this is Rad's uh, GitHub uh, page. Um, we did not rehearse this together, so I'm glad he was standing next to a microphone. Um, and uh, GitHub is a place to put code, but it's also a place to put data, right? And what's cool about that is you can put data up there, and as you start cleaning it, make modifications to it. So what Rad did was this. He started opening up all these different sets of data. For example, let's look at results by party. This is a particular uh, a data set. Let's go into that. You want to talk about where you got this data and what, what there is? Like just, just like 60 seconds on it. Bon, je vais, parce que je vais parler des résultats des élections. On a pris les ressources à partir de, du fichier de Lizzie, parce que, comme on sait tous, il y a toujours des résultats peu, euh, si on prend des résultats des tierces parties, Les résultats ne sont pas aussi tangibles que, que les résultats officiels de l'ISI. Et même les résultats de l'ISI, ils ont un peu changé ou été altérés entre le temps du premier rapport et du dernier rapport. Donc ce qu'on a fait, c'est qu'on a pris le rapport final de l'ISI, on a pris les fichiers PDF, et je... So these are the pages of the final report the BBC, and we just scrape the data from the PDF pages, turn them into XLS pages. And then when you get the XLS pages, or the CBS, card separated files, you can treat them and get them accessible through open source tools. There's a great open source tools called, called Mizu datasets, which gives you the access to 
Excel spreadsheets or CVS files to API it's called JSON or something like that. So <laughs> how long were you working on what and how, how many different other sets of data were you starting were you starting so, to work on? Just to answer that and some of the prep time needed. I think it's really important so everybody gets a step to start budgeting now and start uh, investing resources now in some of the data claim. So actually the project started with uh, other open members or just I'm going to give them the credit because I actually joined after them. Well, uh, Sammy Bonaventan, who actually who is the chief of section in tools at eBay. There is also Dalit Eleni at Zynga. And some of other folks, they started last year. And the first prep work was to see the structure of these websites and see how they could extract data and then how to put them in good format that can be useful. And this process takes, let's say, one month and something like that. And then there came the cleaning of the lab first and giving them an index and something like that. Awesome, cool, thank you. So this, this, is, this is what open data looks like. This is the process of making open data. Here's what you can do once that data is actually open. Let's go look at that exact, uh, that exact example of data set that we just looked at, of those PDFs as listing of just files. Here, um, if you want to see the actual uh, turnout per party, I can now see Anada's actual results across the entire country, kind of in this heat map number format, and be able to mouse over and see the some of the top three uh, parties that are reporting. Or let me go and actually uh, start thinking about, wait, we want to do, we want to do more uh, citizen participation, and really make sure people feel included in this election, right? Let's actually look at potential, like who's eligible to vote and who's registered to vote. These are data sets that we already have right now. Going out there and starting to map this, you get this, you get this heat map of numbers where you can see all the way, all the way down where people are actually registered and maybe where, why isn't there data here? Why is it only 37% here? Why is it 72% great? Why can't we get that in other areas of the country, right? Where should we be best investing our resources? Point being, live data on election day is really sexy. There is a lot of really important storytelling that you can be doing right now to make much more informed decisions about where you should be investing your resources. And that starts with this. That starts by taking PDFs ripping the data out and cleaning it, and that's a lot of work. But when you do this work, you have data prep to use some of the tools like I was showing today to make some really compelling, uh, really compelling maps. Again, in this case, all the geometries have already, have already been prepped too. So what, 24 governance and 265 delegations? All the way down to this? Like, and now you're getting to be, and this is on the internet, so you can share it anywhere. You can share this on Twitter, you can share this on Facebook, you can share this with other people. You can make data that, we, that you can take two totally dispersed data sets and put them together for the first time and then share them with a mass audience. You can start working with the media on this. This becomes a lot more powerful. Um, one last example. Well, let's, let's go look at invalid vote, votes. This can happen for a variety of reasons, right? For, uh, um, but where, where are certain problems? This was not a huge problem. Um, during the last election, but you start seeing uh, certain areas, it's like, well, wait, 5% of the votes were invalidated, right? Why, why was that? Let's start asking these questions now, because what you don't want to do is you don't want to do one of these red dot maps after the election. That only makes people pissed off on the process. Get people pissed off about problems now, so you start solving them now beforehand. And again, that starts with just data cleaning. Um, and like, like you saw in some of the other examples, don't just have this be the map. Be able to say, hey, explain what's happening exactly. Talk about the data. Cite where you got it from. Put the raw downloads to the data here so other people can do other stuff with it, right? This allows you as an organization to be opinionated and tell a story that's highly consumable to a lot of people, but then allows other journalists, other partners to come in and grab the data right from the site. 
So let me let me stop there and just kind of kind of open this up. Um, the power of storytelling. I really just want to show some of the power of storytelling with maps and kind of show how this process of open data uh, stitches together. Um, and it's just it's been a real pleasure uh, working uh, working with Democracy International and Rad uh, around some of this some of this data already. Um, it's it's incredibly exciting to to see so much data already prepped for the election, and I, I hope during the UN conference and some of the prep this afternoon, we can get into more details about what, what kind of data sets people would like to have. List those out, what, or better said, don't even worry about the data set. What stories do you want to tell, number one? Two, then all right, what data sets do you need to tell those stories? All right, now how do you want to communicate it? And this is where some of the mapping stuff comes in. So I hope we can hang out this afternoon and get into some more specifics about what people are looking for, and then I hope Tomorrow, uh, we can really hack on, on, on some of this data together. So thank you very much. Let me stop there and open this up to any questions. <laughs>